Hello again, everyone. I hope you're all doing very, very well out there. And uh, some interesting, fun, exciting things to talk about today. Uh, we got the commentary out for Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Brand new 30th anniversary commentary for the animated film. Go check it out. Of course, I'm wearing my Batman shirt to kind of remind you that throughout the entire video here. And uh, we also, I also put out a review for the Born Supremacy. Now, I did the, the one for Identity about three years ago, and I was kind of batting around back and forth because the original one didn't do too, well, too hot because it got released and there was a copyright claim on it and it got blocked. And I was just wrangling around with it for back and forth here and there. And then it got, finally got released, but then it was demonetized. It was a big fat mess three years ago to kind of deal with the entire thing with the universe and the copyright system. Then she got the thing cleared and everything like that. But it was always kind of like, it didn't perform very well. I was kind of iffy about actually doing the sequels or anything like that. But I finished the entire thing with this Star Wars special edition video. I just felt like I wanted to not jump anything too too big. felt like this was an easy one I could slip into it within a day or so and research it real quick and get into the whole thing and review it and stuff like that. So it went off very well. I thought it was, I personally think, it's one of the strongest videos I have done this year. I thought the critiques and the way I constructed everything, it all came out very, very well. I felt it was very substantive analysis of a sequel that I felt did a lot of the, all the right things that a sequel needs to do. And also the fact that it doesn't get talked about enough when you're talking about the best sequels ever made. So I did a lot of things in that regard, covering this entire cast. The interesting stuff to talk about with Paul Greengrass's approach to the entire thing, the shaky cam trend that went on after that, born out of the entire film, no pun intended, all that type of stuff. So I went very thoroughly through the entire film and just now analyzed a lot of interesting things. on. So I hope you guys have checked it out, watched the whole video, interacted with it, get into it, because I thought I really put a lot of work in this whole thing. I thought it was really, really, really good. I think it's one of the best reviews I've done this year. Aside from the Exorcist one, I think it's one of the very best ones I've done this entire year. Maybe the best one I've done for maybe a couple of years. I thought it was a really, really good, solid type of review video. So go check it out, guys. I thought it was really, really good. And uh, moving on to what's coming up soon here is that tentatively, almost 100% certain we're still doing this on Sunday, but Steve is driving down from Wisconsin for work. Where he's filling in somewhere else on, on a work trip in that regard. It's about a three-hour drive, so he's coming directly from there down to here, and then, presumably, then we're recording our commentary, so long day for him. But we are set up for two commentaries. One is one I already have in terms of media pickup. I got the uh, Poseidon Blu-ray, like, last year or something else like that. We were ramping up to do Poseidon Adventure for New Year's Eve last year. Phenomenal film. Fantastic commentary. Go check it out. Because we are doing the remake for New Year's Eve commentary this year. So the Wolfgang Peterson, Kurt Russell one, Josh Lucas, or anything like that. It was 2006. Be going through it very much on that regard. And that is our second commentary that we're doing for the day. The first one is our Christmas offering. Aside from Mask of the Phantasm, which is a 30th anniversary because it was released on Christmas Day in 93. But a particular holiday classic. Absolutely fantastic. We're doing Bad Santa. I, I got the Blu-ray because I already had the DVD before of just the unrated version. Well, of course, when we're watching things, we want to have the best quality possible. And so I got the Blu-ray, which does have the unrated and the director's cut. Now, we're doing the unrated version because I haven't seen this one. Steve presumably has because he says it cuts out a lot of things, a lot of the best parts. So I know there's certain things. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll research a little bit. I won't watch it, but I'll at least look into what was cut out and stuff like that just to have a little bit of a conversation on that. But we'll be covering the unrated version of this. I just watched it last night, and it's goddamn hilarious. Goddamn. I don't know if we're going to... We're, this is not going to be an analysis commentary. This is just us having a fun time watching an hilarious movie. So anything like the Clue commentary or something else like that, this is what we're going to get into. We're just going to have a fun time running through it, having good stuff to talk about in that regard. So that's all we're here for. We're just here to just shoot the shit and get through this thing with wonderful talent and hilarious comedy. Great type of stuff. It's also the 20th anniversary of this film, so this got released in November of 2003, which sounds like, I didn't remember it being that far back. Not at all. So it's like when I saw like it was 2003, geez, I didn't think it was that far back. I thought maybe 2007 or something. Unreal. Unreal stuff. But before we get into all the media pickups, there's some other things to cover on this whole thing, because uh, 
course, like I said, those two commentaries we're doing now in January, we're doing a Stephen King doubleheader. We're going to be doing Cujo, finally, and at Needful Things. So these are going to be all both off of the King Lorber 4K edition. So again, we're watching the very best things available. We'll be getting the Needful Things 4K so I can actually watch the extended TV version of the whole thing. Now, I did have the old Blu-ray, but since they had the 4K announced, I kind of sold it off about two months ago. Where I was kind of like thinking I was going to order it, but I didn't end up ordering because things were a little bit tight here and there. But uh, there's sales going on right now, so i got to check out the uh, the winter sale from Keenan Lorber and see what, when the end date is. Hopefully not too soon, but anything like that. So there's certain things we're getting up to on that regard. So we're doing King in January, double header on that regard. So it's going to be a really good time to think because it's been a long time, long, long time since we did some King. And we kept pushing it back because the King of Lorber release was not on the anniversary date. It, got, it was already in October. And then we had tied up in other things and here and there and everywhere. So anything like that. So that'd be kind of cool. We'll do a King double header and get good things off on that. Video-wise, coming up soon, I've got two things batting around. I'm not really set to do either one of them right now because I've been catching up the commentary stuff, and we just I just released I just released a commentary, I just released a review video, so I don't have a I don't need to jump in it right the hell away, but I can at least do some prep work on this whole thing. One again is getting back to the Exorcist three video, since I put it off because things were just not kind of grinding along at the end of October. I just was really not in in. In a way where anything in life was clicking together, it was like it was just too much of an arduous thing. All the forces in the universe pushing against me, it's like, this isn't happening right now. I'm not in a good place to do this. So I went off and did the Star Wars thing for the Retro Video Series, Special Edition. Star Wars Special Edition Trilogy Video for the Retro Video Series. So I got that done. And so what I'm going to get to do is either the Exorcist 3 video, which is still banging around my head here and there, or I'm going to go off and do the Blade Runner video, numerous versions of Blade Runner for the retro video series, because I figured, well, I don't know exactly which way I'm going right now, so let me rip all the versions of Blade Runner from my Blu-ray set onto the computer and get everything transcoded. So that's all done. I, and I grabbed the all, all our variant features, uh, featurette, and the Dangerous Days documentary, which is three hours long, but thankfully it's standard definition, so it didn't take that one to rip it. So I got all that stuff on the computer. I just got to do the research now. I got to look into the different versions and make up notes and watch my 4K version finally and, f- and see exactly how good that 4K is. And so I got to put get a lot of stuff. This is not something I can do in a day. I was like, can I do this in a day? No, I can't. I, I could slop it together with a couple of research things online, but I really want to go through the process of really watching the film and an- analyzing things and just get a feel for which one works best for me? Because I haven't really watched in that regard since like the, the the sequel came out like six years ago or something else like that, whatever the hell it was. And so I want to go down and watch things. I want to watch the work print again. There's a particular podcast I want to listen back to. I've listened to it a couple times. It's a Jamie Benning's Film Umentaries podcast. And we're talking about Charles DeLazarico, who worked on all the Blade Runner bonus features, the entire Final Cut thing. He was widely involved with that, and of course, the, all the documentaries on the Alien set, and various other things, the Top Gun um, documentary that's on that set, and various other things, fantastic producer in that regard. He's just doing his first directorial narrative feature, so he's a great, a great guy to follow. He's fantastic to talk with online and stuff like that, and there was another person on this podcast, because he, he had Lars Regan just talking about him and being involved with Ridley Scott and all that type of stuff, but there's another one where they particularly brought on another guest to talk about the discovery of the work print. Someone who actually went to one of those screenings thinking it was a director's cut, but seeing so many weird type of things. So I really want to go back and listen to that because it's a very interesting sort of peering into the genesisness of that, that entire thing around 91, 92, where they kind of discovered this thing and then kind of went off and kind of rushed through doing a, real quick work uh, director's cut for Scott as he was worked on other things. So it's a really good cog in there because I need to kind of get the etymology of each version because stuff with the original theatrical cut, the international cut is pretty well documented, pretty self-explanatory. Studio took some of the creative control array and decided to do different things with it and kind of rework things then. So just getting up to the whole thing of talking about that at the work print, the director's cut, the final cut, very interesting type of stuff. So I've got a lot of stuff I'm going to watch and get into so I can absorb it, get into the entire thing. So now it's something I can get off on right away, so I'm just going to work on it 
little bit here and there and just kind of keep the extras thing in my mind. So as I kind of go through like the next week, I'll kind of get in my head exactly where I am to kind of figure out what the next thing will be. So just that type of thing, because it's like I could do the extras in this three one, but it kind of feels weird now, kind of close up to Christmas. feels kind of weird in that regard. I don't want to do it too late in the month. It's going to feel kind of weird doing that in this type of season. I don't worry how well it play. So I'm just kind of batting things around. I think the Blade Runner thing, will, I think any time of year, the Blade Runner video of this kind would play very, very well. So I think that's something that's smart to get up on and uh, anything like that. So today I was kind of not saying I'm exactly doing this, but it's something I've had in my mind for like a year and a half to eventually do is covering some Brian De Palma films. Since we did the commentary on Carrie, I was kind of like, at that time, I was hoping I was going to do some like videos on De Palma films, like Body Double or something else like that, Snake Eyes. But I've, I've really been kind of one going, because I, I did a couple of the Mission Impossible sequels, and they kind of stalled out because they weren't performing very well. I did the one for three. I did the one for Ghost Protocol. They just didn't gain traction. And I just decided not to bother trying to race against time to kind of do them before Dead Reckoning. I kind of want to go back to the original, because I, I watched that. When I, was, I, was, I was watching all of them, like I did on said on a previous update back in like July or something, I went back and watched them all in my 4K set. I watched as much as soon as I could get through. But I really loved the first one. I was like, I want this. This is great. It's a great movie. Kind of want, if I'm going to do kind of a, a delve into Palm, I'd really like to do His Mission Impossible, eventually watch Carlito's Way. Of course, Body Double, Snake Eyes a little bit. I, I, those are all things kind of on the map that eventually do so. Maybe, maybe January will, well, maybe right after Christmas, I'll probably get around to maybe Exodus 3, then maybe do Mission Possible after that. So we'll see how things go in the next couple of weeks. Don't want to plan and, and guarantee anything too far ahead. Just things swirling around in my head. It's like, that might be a, a nice tentative map of where to go in the next month or so. But it feels like the Blade, Blade Runner thing feels like the most tangible thing. They'll still play well in this month and that type of thing. So be a little bit of work, but I think it'll be kind of interesting and stuff like that. So I, I really, I, I started listening to some music off the soundtrack and various other things. So I think I'm good. I mean, of course, I've always got my director's cut poster up here in the corner. It's been here in every fucking update I've had in this place almost from the beginning. So it's up there. So anything like that. So anyway, before again, before I get into the media picks, I know you're waiting for that, but there's some, some really good stuff here, but we have to talk about The Abyss. Now, I've kind of not gotten around to Blu-ray updates, Blu-ray news updates, stuff like that, for reasons here and there. But anyway, like that, we got the announcement. We got the announcement and all everything. My video on the retro video series from three years ago, talking about why The Abyss and True Lies are not on Blu-ray, is now obsolete. It's completely just useless now. There's no purpose to it anymore because they're coming out. We're getting... Titanic's coming out, I think it's this month, I think it's coming out right about the next week in 4K. Then in March, we're getting Aliens, True Lies, and The Abyss all on 4K. And I went to see The Abyss theatrical special edition re-release this Wednesday. This scene looked wonderful. And I've always ever watched the film once before. It was about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. I rented it from a family video on DVD. And watch it late at night, because, I mean, it's almost three hours long. I was watching it till like, the wee hours. But watching this again on a on a Cinemark XC screen, which used to be a, a Regal RPX. They switched over back in July. Regal left the entire theater and then gave it to Cinemark, and they rebranded things here and there. Fantastic. Mar marvelous premium large format screen. Wonderful. Wonderful type of stuff. The thing looked fantastic. Now couple things. There is grain management involved in this thing. I really couldn't pick up like actual film grain in the entire thing, but it's not like the T2 version. There's not waxy faces and this thing is scrubbed to death. I could see definitely a lot of lot of detail in faces where you're getting close-ups of faces like Ed Harris. You can see the stubble and the pores on his face and stuff like that. Various things. Michael Bean where he's got all the facial hair and stuff like that. A lot of people in the entire film, you could see a lot of things on foreheads and cheeks and everything like that. Really could see it. It's not the most pin sharp thing in a lot of regards. It's still good. It's still really good. Don't 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 get off on certain things. You when you see this yourselves, whether you're going to get it on digital next week, 
We'll wait till March to get the actual physical disc. This is going to look fantastic. It's going to look just blow everything away. You can retire your old laser disc and your old DVDs if you want. It's going to look wonderful. The color is skewed a tad bit towards the cyan, maybe a tad on the teal stuff, but it's not bad. It's I think I think I think the film just looks really good. And I don't want to overstate things here or there, or run people to certain things and whatnot. But I thought watching the thing looked really wonderful, really wonderful. And they didn't. I didn't detect any kind of touching up with visual effects or anything like that. I think Cameron preserved the film very, very well in that regard. A lot of stuff still felt like 1989 visual effects. He didn't go in there and try to redo things or try to cover up certain things. Maybe um, closer frame-by-frame examinations. Maybe people will find maybe a thing or two here or there that they kind of patched up in some places. But I thought he did a very respectable job with this transfer, and of course they remakes it in Adobe Atmos. And I don't know if I don't know if the Cinemark XC did uh, Atmos in their entire theater, but I probably think so because they're doing 4K projectors in the XC theaters. So I figured probably they do. They're going to do the premium large format. You want to have the surround sound stuff like that. And this was only playing in like XDs and RPXs and Dolby Cinemas and AMC. So making sure that people are seeing this in the utmost high-end quality they could get it. So I thought the the thing just looked wonderful. I thought it looked really, wonder, really, really wonderful. And like I said, with, with the green management, there's not a lot of things to really kind of pick apart in that regard. It's like, certainly, like I said, you're going to look at things a lot more, particularly when you get the actual highest bit rate release or whatnot. But I thought they did a really good job. They didn't go overboard in certain things, but certainly did you kind of pick up like, Real fine grain details probably shows that maybe it was kind of going a little bit hard on certain things that kind of match it in certain places and maybe not being one hundred one hundred percent consistent from things parts to parts in the entire film. As I was reading stuff on forms here and there, people kind of analyzing certain things, or all kind of looking at the entire presentation in certain ways. Of course, there's uh, I don't have access to, but someone saw there was a Apple Pro Res video file of the trailer release. That was not 4K, but it was 1080p. People were taking a couple of stills and kind of examining it here and there. So there's a lot of things to really get into, but I think people are going to be very, very well pleased with this presentation. And like I said, the colors, well, I have to judge a little bit more because I don't know if they might be a 4K presentation, but it still might have been SDR in my regard. If you're at Dolby Cinema, it's probably Dolby Vision. But anything like that. So once we get the actual disc and stuff like that, we'll get a much more thorough examination on the whole thing, but generally I thought the thing looked really good. It was a really fantastic film. I mean, Ed Harris, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio, Michael Bean, their incredible performances in the entire film. It was so much of a stronger film that I really had memory for watching it so many years ago. It's just fantastic. Of course, we get all the bonus features, watch the documentaries, and find out how much of a absolute freaking insane production the entire film was you can go for it if you don't already have those old releases once you get the entire new version of it on 4k you're going to go delve into these entire uh, special features and learn all the types of things in that regard so i thought the film was just incredible wonderful type of stuff i didn't find too many tam- pieces of tampering you might find the colors kind of tipped off to a certain degrees but never entirely certain unless you've actually seen a proper theatrical film print screening in the entire thing probably don't have like on home video exactly a representation of how the film was originally presented so I think there have been some of those over the last couple of years but they're probably very sparse in that regard so I don't know anything like that I thought the film looked very pleasing I think people are going to be very much wowed by the whole thing on the large part and of course the at most probably not the most like deep bass rumbling type of things I experienced in the entire thing but I thought it had a nice spatial audio in certain places, had a good sensibility about it, and the Alan Silvestri score was very, very well prominent in this entire thing. So, you know, some, some, here's some people saying, like, on times when they do these Atmos remixes or any general remix in that regard, sometimes they kind of, like, favor the sound effects over the entire score, but I think Cameron really oversaw every detail of this whole thing. I really want to make sure that score was very much strong in the mix. You could really get that real emotional and wonder sense of the entire film there really is worthwhile. So there was also the entire thing of actually getting a nice, I think it was a 13, 12, 13 by 19 or something else like that. 12 by 19 
12 by 18, I don't know. I haven't measured this thing exactly. I think it's, I have a frame for it from something else, but it's really nice, high high quality uh, satin paper, wonderful type of stuff. And it's got, of course, an advertisement for all the releases coming up in that regard. So it's got you know, Fox and Lightstorm and Paramount on here because Titanic is a Paramount release in that regard. But since it's more of a kind of Cameron's entire thing of Lightstorm kind of approving all this stuff at the same time, it's kind of a mix of the entire promotional push from them so thing was i didn't know that we were getting these posters until after i after i completed my screening and i was looking on social media particularly my buddy bernardo who's got his own channel and stuff like that but fantastic film fans stuff like that we interact so much online he actually showed in his instagram stories what that he had the posters like they didn't hand out any posters at mine so I kind of get on, got on certain things. I, I tried contacting on Twitter and, of course, emailing through the website. But I figured I work like freaking five to ten minutes. It's not even ten minutes away from the entire theater. I work less than that. Where I work is less than that type of drive time towards the theater. So the next night I just decided, okay, I'm just going to drive over to the theater and ask them about the whole thing. And, yeah, they had a mountain of these things. The guy came out with the entire package and had to rip the entire thing open. So I don't think anyone got these at the theater that night uh, from evidence of that. But it's a really, really good quality thing. So if, you, if you're if you nearby one of those theaters that did run the showing, ask them for a poster because they probably can, they might still have a ton of them sitting around. I mean, I was in a big old, big, massive theater. There really wasn't that many people there. So I probably had a ton of these things that kind of fill a good portion of the entire a screening if they if that ended up being the case some places that said their places were packed mine was not very much in that regard but they had a whole ton of these things so if you can find a list of those theaters that had the screening hey go go up to the entire counter or whatnot ask them hey, if they still got any posters what else are they going to do with them send them back i don't know but i definitely definitely thought the film was fantastic i thought it looked fantastic sounded fantastic so i think you guys can be very pleased with this whole thing the wait Seems pretty much worth it. And apparently a lot of people said that when they did the special edition version of it, because there were there were some limited theatrical screenings back in 92 when they did this. Apparently there were some little jump cut splices when they added in the new footage, because usually when you're doing the edit-based edit stuff and you're cutting it on film, you kind of lose a couple frames after the entire cut. And so they kind of had to kind of splice things back together with slight jump cuts. Not present at all. Everything looked completely seamless. I couldn't even tell what was cut before what wasn't. Because I don't think I ever watched the actual theatrical cut of this whole thing. I thought I just, I think I just watched the special edition on its own. I just knew a few minor things that were kind of cut here and there. Especially things with the ending in some places because they couldn't achieve the original effects back in 89. But when they came up a couple years later with ILM, they kind of redid things. But I thought it just looked really, really fantastic. And the effects... Still look like 89 effects. Some places they don't, don't look quite as much like some of them you get now. And like, like you would do, do it. Like you would do Avatar or something else like that. But they still look indicative of their, of their time. But they look very, very good for their time. But anyway, like guys. Now they got 20 minutes or so into this thing. Now we get into the media pickups. Which I'll try not to dwell on too much. But uh, as I mentioned on the last update. I did have two things in progress of uh, being uh, shipped to me. Which was uh, Black Phone and Beast with Idris Alba, and uh, these were from uh, the Groove, G-R-U-V, store on eBay, and they had these things for dirt cheap, and then plus they had, if you got like two or more, you got an extra discount on top of it, so I figured, well, I like Beast well enough, when I saw it in the theater, I was like, okay, for, for dirt cheap, I'll grab it, I'll grab it, it's not, it's not a damning thing about the entire film, it was fine, it wasn't exceptional, it had some detriments to it, it's like, it was a fine survival thriller. I thought it was fine. It certainly could have been better in some places, but it was a fine piece of work. Good performances, good effects. I definitely recommend seeing it. It is up on Peacock if you have it. You go check it out, watch it in that regard. But I, I, I went to see it when I was having I, I was having a really bad time with certain things at, at certain points of time. I was supposed to go to a concert that night, but I was I just it was the time I was sleeping like shit. I felt like crap. Things were not even great going going well, it was in bad moods, stuff like that, so I canceled going to the movie, canceled going to the concert, 
and decided to just go to this on a whim or whatnot. I thought it was fine. I, f I forgot my glasses, though. So I didn't, couldn't quite see things quite as well. And there's a lot of dark nighttime photography in the film. But I did have my glasses when I, see the, when I went to see The Abyss. I always remember to bring my glasses now because I do have a uh, detriment to far-sighted vision. So very particular to see things very clearly when I'm going to see a film like that. And especially when I'm going to assess those technical qualities of the remaster. But uh, we, have pinned it, we haven't put it on the schedule yet, but we are going to be doing Sinister and the Black Phone for commentaries next year. So Scott Derrickson double feature, Ethan Hawke double feature, and they just greenlit a sequel to the Black Phone with the same people involved. Derrickson, Cargill, Joe Hill. The entire cast is coming back. So as it's a ghost story, you could have the grabber come back. You can have them come back in some sort of spectral form in some places. Interesting. I'm, I'm very interested because I think these guys, Derrickson's fantastic. I think he, I got to watch more of his stuff. I definitely have to see Exorcism of Emily Rose at some point in time and get more up on certain things. I did see that film he did, Deliver Us From Evil. It wasn't a total winner for me, but it, it, it still had some things that I thought were compelling in some places, but I wasn't a total winner for it, but I love fucking Sinister. Black Phone's fantastic. All that type of stuff. So, great stuff in that regard. And uh, we get to the stuff I got in my own pseudo Black Friday. Because I had things on my Amazon wish list. I was checking them all week long. And almost nothing went on sale. There's more stuff on sale now on, now on my wish list than there was on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Which is weird. But right now I can't, <laughs> can't drop that fucking tons of money on this stuff. So I'm just kind of biding my time on certain things that I really need for upcoming projects or something else I really desperately want to have. So anything else. But anything, guys, I really want to, I really want to get Forest Bueller's Day off on 4K. Now, I, I was going to buy it maybe a couple months ago. Then kind of like held off on it because I figured it would probably go on sale on Black Friday like many things typically do. But it didn't. But I found a seller on eBay who had a whole bunch of these brand new in the shrink wrap with the slip cover, selling it for $15. So I grabbed that, obviously. And just got the 4K on it, but it's got the old commentary on it, which was not included along the other versions. It was only on the original DVD release. The commentary from John Hughes, which you could find online someplace, you could download it. I thankfully, thankfully, they actually included it on the 4K. So it's comprehensive. You got all the bonus features on the 4K disc. Anything that's from the old DVD and Blu-rays and whatnot, it's all on here, so I might keep the old Blu-ray. I haven't sold out the Blu-ray. I might keep it just for the sake of having a copy I could rip for some reason. If I ever, I don't know, I just like to have these for security reasons. If I ever have some far-off video and I'm talking about John Hughes stuff, I like to at least have a copy around that I can actually rip footage from until someday I can get a 4K um, drive. I can rip all that stuff. But right now, just the Blu-ray stuff, but I just like probably keep it in the back pocket in that regard, but I, mean, I, I might be watching this over the weekend here soon, but uh, haven't haven't popped this one in that really kind of look at it, but I've looked at a lot of comparisons from the Blu-ray up to the 4K, and it looks very, very pleasing, very promising in that regard. But the other thing I really had to get, and this is an import, it's about $20, $21 up on Amazon. I, I, Amazon gave me a free month. They just Here's a free, free, free trial month going into the Christmas season, stuff like that. So, since everything else kind of bottomed out on Black Friday, I figured I gotta get the driver on 4K. Walter Hill, and I did a video on this a couple of years ago. Fantastic film. It has a quote on the cover from Edgar Wright of all people, who did, who was inspired to do Baby Driver off of this film. Of course, Nicholas Winding reference film Drive was also. It's all over this film. You couldn't see it completely. The inspiration is just painted all over the entire film. I popped this one in. I popped this one in. I got it today. I popped it in before I did this stuff. And it was like, this looks really, really good. And sadly, Ryan O'Neill just passed away today as I'm recording this on Friday, December 8th, 2023. The day I got this in the mail. So, I, I, can't, I can't say better things about this. Go to watch my video on it. Phenomenal film. Ryan O'Neill, Bruce Stern, Isabella Johnny, Walter Hill, right before he does The Warriors, 
and 48 Hours and Streets of Fire. This is just classic. It's seminal. You have to watch this film. If you have enjoyed Walter Hill style filmmaking, this is absolutely 100% essential. I'm glad this came with a slipcover. It's from Studio Canal. And uh, because at least the film opens with a 20th Century Fox logo. So I imagine potentially Fox still owns the rights to it, or technically, technically Disney 20th Century Studios still owns the rights to the film domestically. And so Studio Canal went ahead, did the proper restoration, because there's been a couple of Studio Canal things that have been not well graded. They've not been well handled. Certain things just get... I've seen, like, one for Raw Deal, Red Sonia. The colors get completely screwed up. They look really, really bad. They're not, not really well represented in the entire thing. They put the right people on this one. It looks really, really fantastic. It's got Dolby Vision. Only the original mono soundtrack. No, no remixes in that regard. So, But it's nice that they preserve that. If they're going to do anything like that, I'm glad at least it's the original, original soundtrack of the entire film. So, And it's got new, new bonus features from Walter Hill himself and all the stuff that was on the DVD release with the trailers and the alternate opening sequence. So... It was, it was very interesting, the fact that, I mean, a lot of the Walter Hill stuff is getting its due now. I mean, Wall, Warriors is coming out in 4K this month from Arrow Video, both versions in the theatrical cut and the director's cut. All that type of stuff. I mean, you got the 48 Hours films, you got this, you got Streets of Fire, they're all getting 4Ks. Recently, Shout Select actually uh, announced his Bruce Willis film, Last Man Standing, as just a Blu-ray with a 2K interpositive scan, and there's no bonus features. There's like a trailer, and that's it. It's like, with all these are other Walter Hill films getting this kind of re renaissance, this sort of like real, just like the respect, the recognition, all that type of stuff is really coming into prominence right now. Think of when he's doing interviews for everything else, there's interviews on on all these entire restorations. Didn't just tap him for anything, apparently. So just a new scan, and that's basically it. It's kind of sad that regard. They're probably going to charge 20 bucks or so for it. 25 maybe. And so, that's kind of unfortunate in that regard, but, uh, this film is just a killer, killer type of stuff. Brilliant masterclass filmmaking, excellent type of stuff. But, uh, moving on to the last bit of things, because, uh, when I was, when I was editing the Star Wars Special Edition video, I always have something kind of playing in the background or whatnot. Usually I have a computer here, then I've got my phone set up on this little stand I have here, and I'll have music going, or I'll have YouTube videos going on, or music videos, or maybe I'm watching a show, or something else like that, and uh, I was up on uh, up on the Prime app, or the uh, on the Freebie stuff, and they had a white collar. And it's like, man, I just started watching a couple episodes, like, this thing really holds up. It holds up as a really fresh, fun, fantastic show. And I already had the first four seasons on DVD, but I kind of fell off getting the rest of them. Whatever the reason was, years and years ago. So uh, I ended up, I now have the entire series. <laughs> I have the entire series because uh, there was one place, there was a resale shop nearby that I went to when I was looking around for the couple of the Exorcist DVDs here and there. And I kind of remember that they actually had season five on DVD. So I went back there and grabbed that for four bucks. And then I found uh, the, the more interesting thing was, was season six was that I actually ordered off of eBay, which a seller I ordered from plenty of times, but they came in and it looked really bad. Because it was it was marked as being in very good condition, which means there's no real blemishes on the entire thing, here and there and everywhere, so it just I stepped down from like new. So pretty much no real damage or whatnot, but it came in looking like someone ran it through the dirt. They had all the little sticker things all over the thing. There were scratches. I couldn't tell there were stra scratches, or something else on the disc, but it's like, I, I contacted you back, they refunded me. And they apologized the whole thing. But uh, thankfully, the high price, high price books, five minutes from me, had this for almost the exact same price, and it was sealed. So I should have just gone looking over there or whatnot. I don't know why I didn't. But uh, sometimes you're just flipping through things like, ah, I'll just order it here instead of going out looking for it. But uh, I also... Because, again, I had the first four four seasons on DVD. But season one is the only one that got a Blu-ray release. Now, this is around 2010, 2011 or so. 
And so it, it was a kind of a test bed type of thing. This is all 20th Century Fox as well. That's all up on Hulu as well. But uh, all in HD on Hulu if you want to go that route. But I really wanted to own it after I kind of sampled the first couple episodes of Season 1 again. And uh, I know they put out Burn Notice on Blu-ray for Season 1. And this on Season 1. And they probably didn't sell as strongly as possible because whatever reason, it's kind of this weird... It was maybe a couple years later when things got a little hotter with Blu-ray, kind of get more of a larger market share in that regard, and the, all the stuff was selling a little bit better. I don't know, but this, the first seasons of the two, that the first season of both those shows apparently didn't sell very well, so then Nick's doing more of them on Blu-ray. They just put the rest of them out on DVD. Now, it's kind of unfortunate, but I figured, well, what the hell? What the hell? I'll, I'll, I'll upgrade this, because I knew there was a disc replay nearby that had this, because I was, when I was on my travels looking for their stuff. I knew they had it for seventeen seven ninety nine. I figured what the hell. I might as well. I'll still have I still have the season one DVD around here. But I'll probably go on my pal for stuff to sell. The only annoying thing is that there's absolutely like no spine consistency whatsoever. You might think four and five might, but there's slight little differences like the, the size of the, the photo on the thing and some of the alignment of certain things. It's, can't just follow a template and put it in the right way. It's just very, very annoying. But White Collar is fantastic. And Matt Bomer has actually said that there are serious talks in doing a revival series of it. So we'll see. And I also saw that, that USA and Peacock and whatnot, but <clears throat> mainly USA is looking to, I don't know if they're particularly reviving any series, but they're kind of looking back towards that era of the shows they were making with this and Burn Notice and like Suits and In Plain Sight. All that type of stuff. We're going back to that. We want to revive that style of show they were doing back then and kind of do it back on USA, but also do on a Peacock as well. So that could go well. But like I said, this and Burn Notice were 20th Century Fox television production. So with the with both shows, I believe, being on Hulu now, I imagine if anything happens with those, they'd be through, through Disney, 20th Century Studios, and stick on Hulu. So... Might be ones that they'd have actually produced from Universal or whatnot. So we'll see where that goes. But it's all kind of nice, nice ideas. I, I would, I did feel like the last season of of uh, White Collar because it was it's only six episodes. Felt like it got wrapped up a little, little rushed. Felt a little rushed. So it was a little, a little bit off. But I definitely take it more over the Burn Notice uh, final couple seasons. I thought Burn Notice went on too long. I thought it just it, it stretched itself on too long. It kind of lost a lot of the, the wit and the comedy and the humor and whatnot. It became way too like heavy drama, drama type of stuff going on. And I didn't like. I stopped watching before the for the ending. I just kind of read what happened in the ending and spoilers. And I didn't like what they did on the whole thing. So I don't know if they, I don't know if that's ever going to get a revival because I heard Jeffrey Donovan left the Law and Order revival because of creative differences. So. He's got an opening somewhere, I guess. But uh, I, I would take I would take more white collar. But the only thing is, Willie Garson passed away like two or three years ago, so not having Mozzie in the entire show would really that would, that would be a hole in there. That would be really hard to fill and whatnot. So, but Bomer, Tim Decay, Tiffany Thiessen, everyone on that show was really really fantastic. I really enjoyed kind of just diving back into the show. So I'll definitely be putting it on and catching up. And watch watching as much of it as I can again. So good type of stuff, guys. So that's a that's a long update. But a lot of things really fun to talk about and various other things. And uh, I did go back to a comic book shop recently because I was like, I really want to. I just really want to go back. And uh, I started re start, started reading that uh, Nightwing trade paperback. But I figured because I saw the announcement of the first volume of the new Superman run getting its trade paperback collected edition. And there were two issues I did not have, which was issue number five and the annual. So I went off, at least went to a comic book shop to wrap up that arc. I haven't read them yet, but I at least want to say that I went back to a comic book shop. I had a very nice time going back into one. And uh, I just want to catch back up on this stuff and really delve back into it and have a good time with it. And I really want to wrap up this run from, uh, is it Williamson? I think it, it, Joshua Williamson. Like I said, this is the one that I felt like was very much... Pretty much all that DC animated universe vibe, that sort of DC, that sort of Superman the animated series vibe. 
I was hearing like that Clancy Brown voice with all the Lex Luthor dialogue. It felt so much like that. The art style felt not exactly like that, but it had a sort of a cartoony sort of uh, look to it in a certain way. So it really had that bright, vibrant sensibility to it. And so once I get up on this, I'll probably go back to the action comic stuff and try to wrap up where that ran run kind of concluded in a certain way. So I sure want to get into the stuff. It's just like, got to make sure I can fit it into the budget of certain things every month. But uh, it's all fun stuff. It's all good stuff. So guys, like I said, wrapping up with that and talking again, Mask of the Phantasm commentary out now. Go check it out, guys, because it's a nice breezy one. It's about hour 17 or so. We get through it very well. And uh, I was wa- we were watching it off the old Blu-ray, the Warner Archive Blu-ray. It's like, yeah, I'm sure the 4K definitely looks better because I was looking at some compar- comparisons. The 4K does look really good. I did see that it's kind of down to about $18 now, like Target and Amazon, certain places. So if you're watching this and you might want to skip over there and see if you can grab that real quick or whatnot. But uh, interesting stuff to talk about on that. So, um, guys, thanks so much for checking out this update and uh, checking out all the other things on the ch- channel here. We got the Patreon to contribute everything a every, little bit every month. Get some early access to certain things. Of course, the Super Things feature to contribute anything directly through the channel helps a lot. Anything you do around here helps support the channel. Watching and commenting and the like buttons, all the type of stuff. Sharing links around if you can. All really good stuff to really kind of spread everything around. And uh, you guys all have a very good holiday season. I'll see if I can catch up with you again before the end of the month. But otherwise, thanks so much, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.